Hello, and welcome to our Eduro Learning video series, Coaching Fundamentals. In this series, we'll hear from 12 experienced instructional coaches from around the world on topics like how do you define the role of a coach and what are your best strategies in a coaching conversation. My name is Kim Cofino, and I will be your host throughout the series. I've been really fortunate to be an instructional coach in schools around the world for the last almost 20 years, and I've learned a ton from these conversations, so I am super excited to share them with you. If you like this format, hearing from lots of different perspectives on a single topic, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel to get all 12 videos in the series. Turn on notifications to find out when we're live on YouTube and to be the first to see the next installment. Have questions about instructional coaching or would you like to see a specific video series related to anything about education and technology? Leave us a comment below and let us know. Want to see even more instructional coaching resources after you've watched this series? Head on over to our website to check out our free resources, more videos, and online courses about teaching and learning and coaching in the digital world. Today's installment of the series is all about coaching conversations. As an instructional coach, the foundation of your practice is deep and meaningful conversations with teachers about improving student learning. Sometimes these conversations are easy and sometimes they're not. Today, our network of awesome experienced coaches from around the world are going to share their best tips and strategies for an effective coaching conversation. Um, my best strategies in a coaching conversation, first of all, is to listen first. I think sometimes I get so excited with something and I have so many ideas, oh, you could do this, you could do this, and I really have to almost temper my excitement and my enthusiasm because sometimes that comes through too strong. Uh, so definitely listen and make sure that I'm listening to what they're going through, what they want to do. Um, again, through cognitive coaching, paraphrasing really helps. So, because sometimes that that will get to a deeper issue or it'll help the conversation go further or look at their thinking. There was, a, a, there was somebody that I was working with before and they were saying, oh, I just want to use technology for, you know, better with technology. And as we looked at what she wanted to do, in fact, technology was not the best way to go, right? And if I just jumped in and said, oh yeah, we could use this tool or we could do this, then it just would have been using the tool for using the tool. But we went out listening and paraphrasing is really important to help me get to the root of what they're looking to do or a problem or whatever it is. Um, so don't be too quick to offer up solutions is an excellent strategy. Um, also knowing the different roles of the coach and knowing what that person wants. Sort of if, do they want me to be a resource provider? Do they want to clarify their thinking? Do they want help with planning or problem resolving or reflection, whatever it is, uh, setting goals? Any of those things, I need to make sure that I'm listening first. So that's really important. The main ones that I try to focus on using is active listening, that you're, you're listening and focusing on what the person's sharing with you. And um, I know in my head, sometimes it's easy to get off track and start thinking about solutions, but really listening to what they're saying. And then following it up with paraphrasing, um, which is an art in itself, I think. Um, paraphrasing, I think, has two main purposes. One is that I want to clarify to make sure I understand what the person is talking about. And, this, and the other reason is that they know that I'm listening. And if, I, if I'm paraphrasing back and I'm, and I'm getting what they're talking about, then that builds the, builds the confidence in the race relationship to move forward. Um, and sometimes um, teachers are really, they're stuck with something. Something's holding them back from moving forward. So uh, a phrase I got from some training was um, using given that. So given that, this is the challenge. What are some ways that we can move forward or get around it? So I feel like that's just a phrase to acknowledge that yes, there is this challenge and I hear this challenge. So given that, that there's this challenge, what can we do to move on? I think going back to that, like trying to make it not so much about as much as it has to be about like the design or the lesson or the unit or the technology they're integrating, try to make it like, I'm just here to help you. I'm just here to support you. I'm not judging you. I'm not telling you you're doing something bad or you're doing something wrong. I'm just here to try to make it better. And I think once you can establish that, that idea of like, this is something I'm trying to help you improve, it really gets a lot simpler after that. But again, it goes back to that whole relationship component and developing that idea of like, um, I'm here as a normal person. Like I'm, I'm, yes, I'm the ed tech director or whatever my role is, whatever I'm called, doesn't really matter. What I'm here to do is support you. Um, I think my best strategies in a coaching conversation is to always have this visual metaphor kind of in the back of my mind. And that's remembering like this conversation is part of a gigantic staircase. 
So sometimes that conversation is kind of the lift to get yourself ready for that next step. Sometimes the conversation is just kind of on the plateau. Uh, sometimes that conversation is getting your balance so that you're ready. Sometimes actually the, the conversation might be, we need to take a step back. Um, so I think that's kind of the strategy is just to think about, okay, this one conversation is not going to make or break anything. It's one step in a series of a staircase. Well, I think um, what's, what's been effective and, and uh, is to know the teacher as a teacher. So I have observed the teacher, have been with the teacher before I sit down and talk to them. So I can ask them questions about, their, um, about what I saw in the classroom and tell them about things that, that are exciting that they do, you know, um, and then and then base the conversation on that, then start to ask questions that might uh, open it up, um, ask them what they're excited, where they're excited about going, it's, particularly if it's a unit you're talking about, if, they, if, they're, if they're interested in rewriting a unit or reshaping a unit or a piece or something, um, is to find out what they're excited about in it and then, um, and then kind of cultivate that. Well, that's interesting because often I'm using strategies that are not really connected to the technology. So in cognitive coaching, we talk about different states of mind and we talk about how we need to identify the states of mind that are in low resource and in high resource. So it could be that there's somebody who's really reluctant to use technology, perhaps because they've had a bad experience in the past. And so that person Although they may be very high in craftsmanship about their subject, they may just lack efficacy in using the technology. Um, and so in that sense, what I would try and do is I would try and have a structured conversation to help them build efficacy. Um, in the same way, there are teachers who really do see that, you know, if they close the classroom door, they're by themselves and it's up to them to really plan and deliver all by themselves. Um, again, much more so in the high school where we do have one person teaching a single subject. Um, and in that sense, perhaps I might talk to them about ways of increasing their interdependence with some of the other teachers around the school. Who else could be a resource for them? Um, and again, I think there are some people who have um, perhaps a closed mindset and they think that there's just one way of doing something or there's one tool that's going to be the best tool. And in that case, having conversations with them where I'm trying to perhaps broaden their perspective and have them think a little bit more flexibly. So in general, with the coaching conversations I have, I'm really not that focused on the technology, but I'm focused on building up um, the resources in that person that are low so that they then can decide to use the technology. My best strategy um, in a coaching conversation is to um, focus on the person's strengths and use inviting language that allows them to um, have some of the answers already within them and to recognize that they do have the answers. Um, to ask questions about <clears throat> whatever the, the the thing you're working on, you could say, um, so what are some different ways you've thought about approaching this? Um, just, just get doing less talking as the coach and allowing the, uh, the mentee to do more of the talking. And I, I think that's, there's, there's great coaching books you can read on specific language to use that uh, to you. But I think it really, the mindset of, I'm trying to pull from the other person and I want to be inviting and invite them to have a conversation where we can work with a number of possibilities. Best strategies for a coaching conversation are similar to what you would do with students. Um, you, you need to figure out where the teachers are and you need to meet them where they are and you need to sort of challenge them in a, in a respectful way. Um, to think about, you know, what's the purpose and what are they, what are the outcomes that they're after, um, and part of it is also helping them understand the landscape in which we're in. Um, you know, the a lot of teachers say, well, if it's not broke, I'm not going to fix it, right? I have an assessment or I have an activity or I have a unit that works really well, but they might not understand the changes that have 
happened since they developed that unit or assessment um, and helping them see, well, if we can think about it from a different way, if we can think about it from, uh, you know, these different uh, opportunities that we have, might that change your mind? Um, for a lot of uh, schools that are currently, like us, we, we use Common Core standards and a lot of the US-based standards, or any set of standards really, um, starting with those standards and thinking about what they really mean, kind of unpack those standards and get to the core of them so that you can really have a good kind of uh, intelligent conversation about what, what teachers are trying to achieve um, and then help them find the resources and the inspiration to maybe think about how they can upskill their students and upskill themselves at the same time. So when I approach like a team meeting situation, for example, um, and I have a goal in mind of kind of like, okay, I have a really good idea for how we can integrate into your social studies unit or your science unit. So what I try to do first is a name the goal of why I'm bringing this up and then um, state the why behind why I think it will be an official or expand the learning for the kids. Um, and then after that, explain the process. So it's always goal, why, process. After that, I always, always say, how do you feel about this? Do you see any challenges? Are you worried? And if you are, I will take that back and come back later. So again, that takes a lot of planning because I have to approach it a good amount of time before the unit starts uh, so that I have the time to take it away and rework my plan if I have to. I haven't always been able to do that. So let's say the unit starts tomorrow and here's my idea. Um, sometimes it has to happen on the fly on right there. And if they say, no, here are big concerns, we don't think it's gonna work at all, then I really don't push it. I have to really understand that if they're not confident implementing it, it's gonna be a disaster no matter what. So yeah, sometimes it's taken me a year, kind of like they say no this year, I bring it back the following year and say, okay, I've thought about it, what about this? And I don't know, slow and steady seems to be what's working for me. I don't like to push too hard because I think that that's just a recipe for failure. Some of my best strategies in a coaching conversation is um, don't talk too much, that's the number one thing. Um, and like, again, I supreme listening, um, really understanding where sort of where you're, you're, whoever you're working with is coming from. If they're super into a specific, uh, you know, maybe they're really into the workshop model or there's, you know, really into a specific area of science or they're really into, you know, want to understand maker stuff better, really sort of helping them figure out what it is that they already have that's going to allow them to sort of build on and, and become better in that area. So I think being a good coach is, is not about your skill set necessarily as a teacher, but more as a coach, which is a completely different skill set. And so being reflective, almost like you're holding a mirror back, having really good questioning techniques uh, to allow them to sort of um, develop a better understanding of where they're coming from. I think is super important. Um, again, uh, cognitive coaching, I think, is, is something that, you know, I know a little bit about, but the, the way, what it helped me do just going through those things, uh, through coaching conversations and, and watching others, is it's really about um, helping the, whoever you're coaching, clarify what they actually want and what they're trying to do. So I think those are, those are some important things. In terms of coaching conversations with um, with teachers, some things that I've found really helpful are, well, I did a course in cognitive coaching, and some things that I really pulled out from there was active listening, so really directing my full attention, not like checking my phone and then um, whatever, when is my next class sort of thing. Um, so active listening and paraphrasing. So what you're saying is, to that or... Um, it sounds like you're really struggling with two big ideas um, and breaking it down for them in a way that perhaps they might not have considered to make sure that they're on this uh, right track. So those two strategies have worked really well across the board in terms of what I do. But sometimes it might be that you're trying to get them to have a go at something. And sometimes, I, like for example, in um, grade five recently, I saw on, we have a BYOD program and they had, um, I saw a lot of kids having 
lots of YouTube notifications come up on their devices. And um, I thought, well, this is obviously quite distracting for kids as soon as they go to do their work in class and they're like, oh my gosh, this person I'm subscribed to has a new notification. Um, so, so we talked, to, so I talked to the teachers and I said, look, would you mind if I came in to do something? Um, and so I came in to offer support and that's not something that's a sustainable model all the time, but it's helping them out and it's giving them some information at the same time that I know that they will take forward um, independently by themselves. So giving them some easy sort of easy entry points where I'm doing most of the heavy lifting perhaps, um, knowing that that's going to be their responsibility further on has worked really well. So I think a couple of strategies that I like to use when I'm having coaching conversations, um, one, listening. Um, I, I, think, I think it's a skill to truly listen to someone. And I say that because it sounds sort of simple, but think about the time, how many times you are listening to somebody only to have two minutes later, wait, what did they just say? Because you're off in your mind about something else. And so, I think it's something that you have to practice and I had to practice that as a new coach. Um, but it's so important to truly listen and paraphrase. And so that is really the, the way that you know you're listening is being able to paraphrase back to somebody what they just said for clarity. You know, maybe you just are trying to make sure you understand, but also maybe you want to paraphrase to shift the conversation one way or the other. So kind of thinking about that. Um, so I think that is a really powerful strategy is truly, truly listening um, as well as uh, as well as just thinking, pausing and thinking about the questions that you want to ask and showing teachers that you are thinking like it's OK to pause and it's OK to kind of take a moment to gather your thoughts. Um, because really, when you're when you're having a coaching conversation, it's usually it's usually a rich, deep conversation about learning, a difficult conversation. And it's not something that either of you, you or the teacher should have easy, quick answers for. Um, you know, you're really doing a lot of deep thinking. So I think modeling that and then teachers know that they also can pause and think before they respond. Wow, so many different perspectives and so many great points about a coaching conversation and the key strategies that make them successful from our experienced coaches in schools all around the world. There's so much to learn from so many different ways of implementing coaching in your school setting that I hope you were able to take away something relevant and useful and practical for you in your individual school setting. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and head over to our website at idurolearning.com to check out more great stuff on coaching and teaching in the digital age. See you there.